Johnson. We're down to two. Now to one. Here's Jordan. Yes! What is true greatness? Is true greatness really putting a ball through a hoop? Who do you associate as truly great? Is true greatness landing a knockout punch? Does this make you great? Is true greatness having a multi-billion dollar company? Or winning an award? Or singing in front of the masses? For me, greatness isn't an achievement. It's a person. you to give it up for Jesus. Greatness is not an achievement. Greatness is not an award. Greatness has a name. His name is Jesus. I said greatness has a name. His name is Jesus. He's the greatest man who's ever lived. He's the only standard of greatness. Give him a shout if you love him. And he's given you an invitation. Sit down. My God. I'm acting like you're in church or something. The only standard of greatness is not in a trophy or an achievement, but it has a face. It has a name. Greatness is a person, and his name is Jesus. Being like him is what greatness is all about. Today I'm going to preach to you a message called an invitation to greatness. We've been talking about DGs this month, discipleship groups, talking about being discipled. And by the end of this service, I pray that if you're not in a group, you're going to get in one. If you're not leading one and God's been putting on your heart, you'll take the step of faith and you'll do what he's telling you to do. Because your days are numbered. You don't know how long you're going to live. None of us know how long. I pray that you have a long, blessed life. The Bible says we can have that. But none of us could in this room walk to the other person and say the exact day we know we're going to go to heaven. <clears throat> the day we're going to be saying bye to this earth. None of us know that. The Bible says Jesus comes and he says it is presumptuous in a sin when you come together and you say one day we're going to go here and then the next day we're going to do this and we're going to build here and go there. Jesus says that is evil. What he says you should say is if God wills it, we'll go there. If God wants it, I'll live there. If God has it for me, that's what I'll do. We're leading our own lives when we already have a leader. His name is Jesus who's supposed to be leading us. We're leading our own schedules. When there's already a God who wrote a schedule for your life before you were even formed in your mother's womb. Every day of your life was written in that book. I want to find out what that book had for my life. I don't want to write my own story. Don't listen to the media. Don't listen to Hollywood. Don't listen to the people who are trying to constantly sell you as a believer on write your own story. Follow your heart. That's the dumbest thing you can ever do. Follow your own heart? Are you serious? How many times has you following your heart got you in some serious trouble? How many people did you have a crush on that you knew in your heart was supposed to be the one? 
Aren't you so glad that your heart was wrong? We don't have enough people thanking God for the closed doors in their life. We only just want a new open door. You go, put another open door. Put another open. But do you know that God saying no is just as much of a blessing as him saying yes? Today, let's talk about this invitation that the greatest man is giving us today. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. Go through a few scriptures. But God is already in this place. And I pray he's beginning to work on you for every word that is said. Listen carefully. As we read the word, this is the holy word of God. We don't come to church and read books. We come to church and read the living book. I'm not interested in giving you any positive statements. They cannot change your life. Don't put other books in your DGs. Stop trying to follow other statements. Stop trying to find other authors. There was the author, his name was the Holy Ghost. He has written the greatest book that gives you all the greatest life lessons, all the greatest principles. If you're too busy studying other authors' books, I would like to remind you, there's an author who actually did it, conquered it, and can help you through everything you've ever been through. Just come back to his book. Okay, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. Nevertheless, when one person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I have to pause there. I've preached on this before. But in this translation of the Greek to the English, this is one of those few circumstances where when we translated this from Greek into English, we actually switched a conjunction and moved a comma. So it says, now the Lord is a spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But that's not actually what it says. The translation of the scripture is, wherever the spirit is Lord, there is freedom. I don't know if you've ever been in a building where God was there, but you weren't feeling nothing. I don't know if you've ever been in a service where worship was going, and the person to your right and your left were weeping under the power of God, and something was happening, but you were like, I guess he doesn't care about me today. You see, it's not just wherever he is, there's freedom. It's wherever somebody has made him the Lord of their lives, they give him access to free them. You see, God's in the building today, but you might get nothing from it. The person to your left might get something. They might walk out with a bit. Before this service is over, people are going to walk out with breakthrough. I just got to tell you. Before this service is over, somebody's going to get a revelation. It could be you, but the question is, are you still the Lord of your own life? Because all it takes is an inner choice and decision to make him the Lord of your life. If he's the boss, you'll get everything he wants from you today. He continues, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image. All of us are being transformed into the same image. Whose image is that? Uh, I don't know if y'all know it. Whose image is that? The middle's got it. How about the left side? Whose image is that? Okay, how about the right side? Whose image is that? Oh, so it's not, it's not Pastor Christian's image? It's not Gavin Tate's image? Are we all on the same page? It's the image of Jesus. Okay. All right. So as we are being transformed into, we can just say, the image of Jesus from glory to glory. Now, this is so good. You know, we like to talk about and sing songs. There's a really great gospel song I love. Going to another level. Right? I like that song. I like it a lot. Because I like talking about levels. We like talking about, I'm on a different level than you are, right? We like talking about, see, I already been to the second floor, but now I'm on the fifth floor. And then you, like, we like talking about levels. But in the Bible, it never talks about levels. It only talks about glories. There is no such thing for a believer as moving in levels. We move in glories. That means that in every season of your life, whether you're on a mountaintop experience, whether you're experiencing some hardship and you're in a valley, Every season, you should still have access to experience glory. 
And why are we moving from glory to glory? You know how? Every time something about you becomes more like Jesus, you increase glory. You start talking more like Jesus, you've increased glory. You start thinking more like Jesus because we have the mind of Christ. You begin to experience glory. You start walking around going where Jesus tells your feet to go. Not where your flesh wants to go anymore. Not where the things used to call out to you. Not where the temptations want you to go. But your feet become controlled and put on the timeline of God. When you're walking on his timeline, what happens is your feet transfer a different level of glory to your life. You get into glorious circumstances. You're constantly walking into another glorious happening. You're constantly arriving into another glorious place. You're constantly shaking hands with another glorious divine appointment. You're constantly coming to people and God's given you a glorious word of knowledge. You're coming in front of somebody who's depressed and God puts in your hand healing which will impart glory into them. You see, every part of your life is supposed to be obsessed with glory. Glory is what shifts the kingdom. Glory is what moves the spirit realm. Glory is what a woman has on her when she's saved herself for her husband. Glory is what a man has on him when he chooses to be pure and say, my past is my past. But now I'm going to choose to stay pure. He gets a glory about him. He's no longer a player anymore. He's not going to be a Christian player as many people are. They just turn into Christians and then seduce women with Jesus. He's going to be an actual person who will have the glory of God because he's pure. I'm going to wait till my wedding night. I'm going to be somebody who's going to be pure. Glory comes on somebody who decides to live for Jesus with everything they are. Not just their left toe. Not just part of their hearing. Well, I listen in church on Sundays. And all week long, I'm listening to the worst music you could ever think. Filth. Well, my eyes look at the word on Sundays. And then I go and look at pornography all week long. You're not sharing body parts with the world and with God. You become somebody called sold out. Say it, sold out. Say, I'm sold out. You see, if you don't get sold out, you're going to think Christianity is just another religion you get to choose from. And if this church doesn't give you what you want, you'll go to the church down the street. You'll go to the church around the city. Why? Because only people who are sold out get all the benefits of what it means to be a real Christian. You see, when you're not sold out, you withhold yourself from joy. You withhold yourself from peace. You're withholding yourself from the breakthrough you need because God can't give it to people who are halfway in and halfway out. He doesn't play like that. He's only one God who sits on the only throne. If you share thrones, he'll just let you sit on the throne. But there's going to be a day you got to get up off your own throne and allow him to sit on the throne of your heart. The ultimate standard of greatness has already been set. And nothing is going to surpass it. There is no man that will be greater than Jesus. There is no speaker or president that's going to help more people than Jesus. There's no politician who's going to come up with such a great bill or such an incredible policy that is going to put Jesus' rules and commandments to shame. Nobody is going to be able to compare with Jesus. He is the only standard of what is great. You see, you and I today, we could think a lot of things are great. Championships, hitting a winning basket, is that really greatness? Having a knockout punch, is that true greatness? Does that matter in heaven? You see, things that God considers great are eternal things. Do you know that it's possible that you could go through your entire Christian walk, you could gain a lot of money, and let me ask you a question, what happens to your money when you die? It's going to go to somebody else. All those hours you worked your behind off. You lost time with your family because of money. You sought money and fame. You know you could have millions of followers that watch you eat chocolate cake. Watch you go to every beach. I'm in Australia today. It's been incredible. You guys need to be here. Sign up for my multi-level marketing plan and you could be here. (laughs) 
I mean, think about that. If you literally spend 20 years of your life and you think greatness is having the freedom of time so I could visit every beach in the earth, you're going to get to the judgment seat. And guess what you're going to give God? A bowl full of sand. I like the beach. My wife loves the beach. I'll take a walk on the beach. It's romantic. I'll go in the sunset and hold her hand and kiss her a few times out on the beach. I love it. But greatness to me is not going and laying on beaches and getting burnt to a crisp like a fish. I mean, just think about the kind of things we think are great. Why is it that people will wait in line for hours to take a photo with a celebrity? Why? Because they want to feel like they're great. And if they can get into a picture with somebody who they consider is great, they'll feel great for a few moments themselves. Why do we want to be around people who have lots of money and, and all those things? If it's to learn, okay, I get it that we, we need to be mentor. We need to learn. But, but for a lot of y'all, you wouldn't mind if you never said anything. You just want to sit in amongst greatness. What you think is greatness. But most of those men and women who have all the money you can think are the most depressed people you've ever met. You ever thought about that? They, their, their families are falling apart. They've been married three, four, five, six times. They do relationships and put them on like you put on pants. They try it on, they take it off. If you follow Hollywood, you know what I'm talking about. They don't know what a commitment is. Greatness to them is how many people came to watch them on the movie screen. Is that really greatness? There's only one standard of greatness to aspire to. You see, Jesus set the standard. If you compare yourself to any other person, you are always wasting your time. Because that person also has issues. Do you know that person has to go to the bathroom like you do? Can we get real for a second? Do you know that person gets sick? Do you know that person has some issues, probably depressed, going with a lot of identity things, can't handle what people are saying about them, needs help, needs help just like you need help? Why would you compare yourself to somebody who's struggling with as many things, if not more, than you are? Only Jesus never gave in to temptation. Only Jesus never needed the applause of men because he had the applause of his father. Only Jesus was God and unzipped himself of his divinity. Who do you know like Jesus? Have you ever met anybody, if I could just ask you a quick question, who has ever gone out in the middle of the Palm Desert an hour away? He didn't have a sound system. He had no microphone. Yet thousands of people showed up to hear him speak. And when he was out there, they all got hungry. And this man, I don't know anybody in San Bernardino who's done this. Please tell me if you know somebody. I, I, I welcome you to stand up. This man gets a few fish, some loaves of some bread, and breaks it and feeds almost 15,000 people. There were 5,000 men, not to mention women and children. And that was just the start of the buffet. Because there were 12 baskets left over. Do you know anybody who's walked on water? I know a lot of guys who've tried. But do you know any man who looks at the stuff that you drowned in and walks on it? There's nobody like Jesus. Can we get this straight? There's nobody to compare like Jesus. There's nobody ever going to be as good as him. There's nobody could ever be as great as him. Nobody. Who else can you in the middle of the night, when you're fighting with an anxiety attack and you can't sleep, who else? You can't call people. It's 2 or 3 in the morning. But you can sit up in your bed. And you can say his name. And he'll come 
and fill the place where there used to be nightmares, worry, and fear. And he'll literally take over your bedroom. He'll come in when you feel lonely and upset. Who else but God? Jesus, can you be driving in your car after one of the hardest conversations you've ever had with one of your kids? You feel guilty. You feel ashamed. You feel like you're a terrible mother, a terrible father. But you're driving and you just could put on a worship song and all of a sudden you don't have to be in the four walls of the church. Your car becomes a church because the aroma of God comes in and he says it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Just repent. Just ask him. Uh, we can move forward from here. Who else but Jesus? There is nobody. Jesus is the only life that needs no improving. He doesn't need any improvements. All you and I, we're going to need to go to counseling a couple times at least. We're going we're to need to get some help from some people, right? I mean, we got questions. We got issues. And a lot of times you don't know how to figure them out. Jesus didn't need any improvements on his life. The only ministry that needs no adjustment is the ministry of Jesus. Why are we full of churches all over the United States of America that feel they have to constantly come up with new ways to entertain people? They constantly have to come up with new ways in order to keep people interested in their programs. They constantly have to come up with new ways in order to get people in the building. Jesus never needed any help. You can't improve on his ministry. We don't need to try to improve on his ministry. We, all you got to do is what he did. Just do what he did. You'll get the results he got. Do what he did. You'll get the results he got. Why? Because there's no other ministry. That's as great as Jesus. John 132 says this. Listen closely. John says, I bore witness that when I baptized him in the water, I saw the Spirit of God descend from heaven like a dove. And listen to these words. He remained on him. Only Jesus is the only man who never gave the Holy Spirit a reason to lift. He remained. Because the Holy Spirit loves how Jesus talks. The Holy Spirit loves how Jesus walks. The Holy Spirit loves how Jesus thinks, has compassion for people, breaks through, casts out demons. The Holy Spirit, and that's why he's trying to make you like Jesus. Because he wants to use you like he used Jesus. That is a hallelujah. Can you give him a praise for that? Matthew 4, 18 through 20, here comes the invitation. The greatest man has given you an invitation. One day Jesus was walking along the shore. He saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and Andrew, throwing their net into the water, for they were fish for a living. Jesus called out to them, and he's saying this to all of us still. Come, follow me, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to change you, I'm going to redirect you, I'm going to change your priorities. I'm going to change your focus. You're fishing for fish, but I'm going to show you how to fish for people. If you'll follow me, I'm going to make you great. I will make you great. And look what it says. They left their nets at once. My God. A lot of people wonder, why did they, I mean, they didn't even know this guy. They didn't even know Jesus. The first time they see him, they just drop everything they know and follow this random guy. You don't understand. In Jewish culture, the greatest thing you can be is a rabbi. It's the greatest. It's better than a movie star. It's anything. A rabbi. Every family who wants to give their son a chance to be a rabbi will train him up to the age of 12 years old. <clears throat> At 12 years old, they will be presented in front of a rabbi. They will have some requirements. One of them is that they have to memorize the entire first five books of the Bible by heart. 
by 12 years old. Not memorize your favorite Fortnite character. Memorize the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus, Leviticus. Numbers, Deuteronomy. And they'll stand in front of this rabbi and he'll look at them and he'll say, go ahead and quote for me Leviticus 22, verses 5 through 15. Go. Now I want you to give me the cross references of Exodus 15 and how it applies to the same principle. Then I want you right now to tell me the historical context of what Moses is really talking about here, when he talked about this, and then go to Numbers 20 and then tie it all together, please. 12 years old. Now, many of these boys would be presented before these rabbis. Peter, James, and John, all of them were presented in front of a rabbi. You only get one chance. So they're in front of the rabbi, and the rabbi would look at them, and then he was trying to find out this question. Could this pupil be me? So he would say when he would choose his pupil, Come and eat my dust. He says, come follow me. The wording of the rabbis was come and eat my dust. Because what you were saying was this. I believe you can be me. So Peter, James, and John are these people who have already been rejected by the rabbi. They went through the test. That wasn't their career that they wanted, the greatness that they were seeking. The ultimate goal was not to be a fisherman. They had already tried and they got rejected. See, God loves to find rejected people. God loves to find people who had tried this many boyfriends, tried this many girlfriends. These people had given up on him. He loves to find the ones who nobody else believed in. He loves to come to you when you're in your worst state. He loves to come to you when you smell terrible, when you look terrible, when you got nothing to give him. And he says, oh, I believe you could be me. The greatest man who's ever walked the face of the earth, on earth, and he's all, guys, listen, he's not just great on earth. Oh, my God. The Bible says in Revelation that John went up to heaven and he saw in heaven. This is amazing. He said that he couldn't find any light switches or any light candles in heaven. But the whole place was lit up. Listen, there are no shadows in heaven. So literally, as this light is coming, I'm seeing my shadow on the floor. It's so bright in heaven, there's no room for shadows. He finally found the light source. The body of Jesus illuminates so much light, heaven is lit up by Jesus. He's not just the star on the earth. He's the superstar of heaven. Now, you're talking about somebody who's the superstar of an invisible kingdom and came down and became the superstar of an earthly kingdom. And he looks at you and me. You got to understand, he looked at the stars and he said, you will be named this, this he took the stars and he flung them into place. He looked at the universe. He looked at the water and said, be. He looked at the light and said, light be. He looked at the mountains and with the same mouth, he looks at you and me and he says, oh, I could do something with this. I think you could be me. Now, you got to understand the invitation. He's not just saying you can be you, but the Bible says that he looked at his disciples and he said, even greater things you're going to do. So I'm not just going to make you, you're going to be like me. But there are things I could not accomplish in my three and a half years. But guess what? I'm still going to accomplish them. I'm just going to do it through your hands, through your feet, through your mouth, through your eyes. I want to make you like me. Matthew 5, 19. If you ignore the least commandment to teach others to do the same. You will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But what's true greatness? But anyone who obeys God's laws, listen, and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know what you associate with greatness. But if you simply look at the words, obey them for yourself, get in a small group and teach someone else to do it, God says you are great 
in his eyes. I don't know if you're interested in that. I don't know if you care what God thinks about you, but I do. I don't care what a lot of people say about me. I don't care what a lot of people on Facebook say. I don't care what a lot of people on Instagram say. I don't need your approval, but I want the approval of God. And he says, I can be great. Two things you're going to get when you get in a DG. There's many, 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 many things. But DGs, small groups, are the way that God set it up that we could become like him. Let me tell you two of my favorite things. Number one, James 1, 22 through 25. Here we go. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only going to be fooling yourself. If you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away. Forget what you look like. But you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free. And if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, God's going to bless you for doing it. There's a story, true story. It's a book called The Girl With No Name. You should all go get it and read it this week. It's a true story of a girl. I read this with my wife on vacation years ago. We cried pretty much through the whole book. There was a girl who was five years old. This is over in Central America. And she was kidnapped from her family. And they were traveling through the rainforest as one of the big cartel groups that was there traveling through the rainforest, and they actually dropped her. So she was dropped out of the sack that they, were, they had her tied into. She got loose, fell on the ground, and she ran into the trees and the bushes, and they looked for her for hours, but she stayed away from them for hours. They finally moved on without her. They had already kidnapped some other kids. So this girl is now in the rainforest, five years old, by herself. Now, about a week had gone by. She was eating berries and throwing up. She was eating poisonous things. Uh, she was barely surviving. And one day, a monkey, this is true, a monkey comes down and begins to help her because her stomach was sick. A monkey takes her to a river, plunges her head in a river so she's drinking the water. So she'll vomit the poison out of her stomach. These monkeys become her family for the next five years. She lives in the trees with the monkeys. She climbs the trees with the monkeys. She talks with the monkeys. She understands the language of the monkeys. She's a monkey. Now, when she's about 9 or 10 years old, there is a couple, a hunter and his wife, that are coming hunting for animals. She talks about this in the book, that she's in the midst of a tree with all of her monkey family, and they're looking down, and she says she sees this woman. And she said, that's the most beautiful animal I've ever seen, a woman. She says, and the woman stops to get some breath and drops out of her bag a mirror. Now, the woman drops out of her bag a mirror, doesn't notice that it's gone, and walks on. When they leave, she climbs down the tree. She picks up the mirror. And she looks at it, and she says, the moment I saw myself in the mirror, I realized I wasn't a monkey. I was like that girl. And that was the moment she decided she has to go and find more women because she doesn't look like a monkey. You see, when you look into the book, you're looking in the mirror. What you do in a DG is you get with other women who all have issues just like you do, but you come together and you pass around the mirror. And you look in the mirror and you say, oh my gosh. I'm not worthless. Oh my gosh. I'm not addicted. I'm not, I'm not an addicted crack addict. Oh my gosh. I'm not a drunk. Oh my goodness. Jesus, I'm a child of God. What? Oh my goodness, Lord God. I still got hope. Oh my goodness, I can still be a mother to my kids. Oh my gosh, I could still be a grandparent. Oh my Lord. You got to look in the mirror and you got to do it all the time. That's why we do it every week. You got to remind yourself because when you leave, you're going to go back into the world and they're going to tell you what they think you are. Your ex-boyfriend's going to tell you what he thinks you are. Your other family member's going to say, but you got to get back with some women of God and you got to get the mirror out. You 
You see, in a DG, you behold the word. And as you behold the word, you behold your true self. And because you're beholding the word, you're beholding the face of Jesus. Because you're listening to what he says about you. And remember, only what God says is actual truth. Don't ever mistake this. There are many truths in this world. Many things that people want to call truth. But truth has already been taken. It has a name. His name is Jesus. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Only what he says has the power to change all circumstances around you. Remember, real truth changes everything around it. The truth never changes for anybody. Number two thing that you're going to get. James 5.16. There's so many more things, but I just want to mention these two. Last one. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. You got to understand something that there are some healings. Every single one of us need them. But there are some healings all the way in the back. I'm talking to you. That when you repent, God will begin, but he will not finish the healing till you humble yourself and get with somebody else. Get vulnerable and you'll receive your full healing. There are some blessings that are reserved only for the humble. Wouldn't it be great if we never had to tell anybody any of our problems? Wouldn't it be awesome if we could just keep our business to us and they could keep their business to them and we could just repent to God and he could just give us everything we need. He does give us everything we need, but he does it in the form of people. He does it from himself and then he requires you to confess one to another. Well, I already confessed to God. I understand. Only God can forgive you of your sin, but if you want to get healed, you're going to have to confess one to another. And the power of God, you got to understand, God has hidden healing bottles, healing prescriptions in the bodies of people that are around you right now. He has created healers through this whole building. You don't think you have anything to give, but you actually are carrying a healing ointment for somebody who is sitting in here right now. There are people in this building, you have a healing prescription for someone who is in a family of somebody who isn't here yet. But you're going to see them soon. And you're going to find that the bottle has already been with you the whole time. God doesn't want there to be the one healer. This is not a movement any longer of the one preacher, the one Billy Graham, the one Catherine Kuhlman, the one. No, it's not about that. It's the army of God. He wants an army of healers. He wants an army of healers. He wants an army. We're doing this together. That's why you ain't got no time to be jealous or envious of somebody else. Don't you know how many people are going to hell right now? When you get jealous of somebody else being promoted, it proves how small-minded you are. There are billions of people on earth. Some of them have never heard the name of Jesus. They're waiting for God's love. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You know why I think the laborers are so few? Because they're all too busy comparing themselves to another. They're competing. Church is competing with church. Members of first members. You have this many members. I have this many members. We are competing and the devil loves it because we're not doing anything for the world. We're talking about colors of carpets. We're talking about our chairs. All the lights are too much. And we have too much haze. And why has it got to be that loud? And why is it not loud enough? And why is it where we're talking and squabbling, people are going to hell. We need every one of you. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you to find your gifts and do it. I need you to get promoted. I need you to get promoted. I need you. We got to care about the harvest. And it's going to require everybody, y'all. Here's the end. Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Jesus said to his disciples, here's the cost. Every anointing has a price tag. 
Every life of power has a price tag attached to it. If you want to pay the price, you'll be able to get it. If any of you wants to be my followers, you got to give up your own way. You got to take up your cross and follow me. Well, you know, I'll get in a DG next year. You don't know how many days you have even to live. How presumptuous are you? Well, I'll, you know, I just don't got time for it right now. We're going to meet every week. That's a lot. I don't know. Every week's a lot. I got to meet every time in the house. I got to drive over there. It's going to be gas money. It's going to be, okay, I got to figure out a dinner. and, and all the, 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 the. When you say no to discipleship, you say no to greatness. When you say no to discipleship, you say no to your potential. When you say no to discipleship, you say, God, your business and your kingdom can wait till I'm ready. Y'all, every day of your life matters to God more than it even matters to you. Your time is precious to God. He wants to use you now. He wants to help you now. He wants you. There is something inside of you right now that you can give. I know that you got problems. I know that your marriage is still needing, but I got to tell you, God has a great way of working with people who have issues and making them into conquerors for the kingdom of God. He's got a way of taking your misery and making it into a ministry. He's got a way of taking your chains. And once they're broken, you will break the chains of others. You just got to submit. If you hang on to your life, it says, you're going to lose it. Stop hanging on. You don't need to hang on anymore. Every person in this building, we're about to go into another series next month. It's going to be on a different subject. Don't let today pass by without choosing to be great. You're choosing to be great when you choose to follow the way Jesus has set it up for you to become great. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world? Come on out, Japheth. But you lose your own soul. Is anything worth your soul? You see, remember this, and we're going to close with this. The value of a thing is not determined because you say it's worth this much. The value of something is determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. The value that you have, Jesus just said. The gross domestic product of the world, I think, is about 1.85 or 2.1 trillion dollars to buy the earth. God says, if you were to gain all of it and you give up your soul, you made a bad investment. God is a businessman. The Bible says he redeemed you. The word redeemed is a legal transaction word. It means he bought you back with his blood. He never makes bad investments. He can't do it. He's God. He's the greatest businessman who's ever been. He never makes bad investments. He never makes bad choices. And when he looked around at all of the earth, he looked at the mountains and he said, maybe they can pay the price for that soul. He said, no, nah, it's not expensive enough. Maybe the birds, look at these beautiful birds, these eagles and these hawks. No, they're not expensive enough. Maybe the oceans, the miles and miles of oceans that have still not been discovered. He says, no, they're not expensive enough. He said, you know, the only thing that equals how much I value them would be if I myself went and died. Jesus considered you so valuable. He didn't give second best. He gave himself. He actually esteemed you, the Bible says, higher than himself. Because he chose to give himself for you. Listen, I don't know what you're going through. I feel such hurt in the building. I feel pain everywhere in this building. I'm sorry, I don't mean to get emotional, but I feel there's weight. I don't know what's happening in your family. I don't know what's happening with you, but I just got to tell you, my life is all about saying one thing to everyone. I've given my life to this, and I want to tell you that God considers you valuable even if nobody else does. I got to tell you that God loves you, that he wants to use you. 
that he's reaching out for you and he wants to use you to become great you don't have to settle don't believe the lies Everybody, please close your eyes. I wrote a song years ago that I felt would just kind of encapsulate this. I'm only going to sing it for maybe a minute or two. And then we're going to have a call. Just close your eyes. And just let God minister to us today. Let's focus on Jesus. Show me your face Cause I long to see The deep wells of love in your eyes I wanna see you tonight Show me your face Cause I long to see the deep wells of love in your eyes. I want to see you tonight. Let me gaze. Let me gaze. Let me gaze on the face that changes me. Let me gaze on the face of love. lifted every person eyes closed there's only one image show me show me your face I long to see come on tell him cause I long to see the deep wells of love in your I want to see, come on one more time, show me your face, cause I long to see the deep wells of love in your eyes, I want to see person as your hands are lifted and your eyes are closed you got to come and follow Jesus you got to make an opportunity there's an opportunity now and a choice whether you're in the back seats Jesus loves you whether you're up here in the front Jesus loves you the same the altar team is coming up now and every person as you're feeling a tug on your heart if he's calling you you got to give over your life there's no withholding anymore. I have two prayers today, and the first one is for people who don't know Jesus. Or maybe you've received him, but you say, God, I've walked away. I haven't been serious about you. I want you to get up right now from your seat, unashamed, and I want you to come down here so we can pray for you. Come on right now. Right now. That's you. I want to receive Jesus. Do not hesitate. Do not hesitate. Do not wait. Look at them coming down right now. It is my privilege to pray with you. Look at them coming down right now. All the way from the back, they're coming. Come on, right now. Do not hesitate. Do not hesitate.
Jesus is reaching out saying, come follow. Come follow. Come follow. He's still speaking. Look at her. She's under the power of God right now. God's showing his love to these people. Come on, they're coming and she's coming up right now. Come follow. Come and follow me. I believe you can be me. I believe you can be me, sir. I believe you can be me. Come on, keep giving them a hand. These are our new brothers and sisters joining our family today. Come on, somebody's here to pray with you. Yeah, yeah, come on. Bring them all the way up. Come all the way up. We're coming all the way from the back. Nobody else is moving. This is a powerful thing right now. Give them a hand. Come on, give these people a hand. Do you know that Jesus is here? Do you hear him calling out? Do you hear him giving the greatest invitation? Look at all these people. Come on. We got room for you. God has a place for you. God has a place for you. This is your family now. This is your family now. Look at him. He's coming up with a son right here. We got a son and a father. Come on. Come on. Hey man, just question, how old's your boy? How old's your boy? He's five, same age as my son, man, that's awesome. That's awesome, you're doing a great thing, Father. Way to be a leader, way to be a leader for the greatest choice ever made. Now listen, I have a challenge for you right after this prayer, so don't move. I want us all to pray this prayer. This is such a sacred moment before God. I know that you guys feel it too. Let's all repeat this prayer, say, Dear Lord Jesus, Come on, loud, dear Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins and I receive your forgiveness. Lord, thank you for dying so that I could be saved. Lord God, I accept the invitation. Make me a disciple. Lord, you're the boss. I give over my opinions. If they're not your opinions, I don't want them. I give over my own rules. If they're not your rules, I don't want them. I hand over my schedule. If it's not what you have planned for me, I don't want it. Lord, today, I receive your help. Be my leader. Become my friend. And Lord God, I am no longer guilty. I'm no longer guilty. But because of the blood, I am made brand new. Right now with your eyes closed, every person around this building, just focus on Jesus and thank him for what he's done. Just let him just talk to you right now. Just receive the love of God. Right up here in the front, let him touch you right now. The moment you said his name, he was already there. He's been waiting for you for so long. He's here to receive you. Just let him love you now. Let him just wash you clean of your guilt and your shame. It's happening right now. We're witnessing a miracle church right now at this altar. The greatest miracle that's ever been. Now they're going to continue to pray with you. They're going to give you an opportunity to get water baptized, tell you some other things. Make sure you do everything they say. Every person who's looking at me in the crowd, now I'm looking at you. Every person out here, I want you to look at me. I'm serious. Do not let another day go by with leaving your potential on the table when God is wanting you to be great. What does that mean? We have a foyer where you need to go and sign up for a DG. The excuses are over. It is time to do it. And if God has been leaning on you right now saying, you know what, you should lead one. You've been in a DG. Don't be afraid. I promise, just take a step of faith. He's going to help you. You're not going to do it alone. But today is the day we should have nobody leaving who does not have a community of believers that are going to strengthen them. This is the way Jesus has created it to be like him. And we all accept the invitation to greatness. Amen? Stand on your feet, every person right now. Lift your hands up. Lord God, we accept your invitation. I just thank you, Lord Jesus, Lord, that we're here in this building. God, whether it's conviction... We submit to it. Your love, God, is behind it all. And I thank you in Jesus' name, Lord. We want to be what you want us to be. We don't want to go to heaven with any potential. God, we take our days seriously. 
We take this moment seriously. We don't take it for granted. Lord, I need help. We all need help. But I thank you. You'll be there every step of the way. I bless you in the name of Jesus with healing that your house is full of healing. If you're sick in your body, that God is healing you. If there is sickness in your house, that that is broken in Jesus' name. I bless you in the name of Jesus with a lack of contention. If there's been strife, if there's been arguing, we say in the name of Jesus that the angels are moving in. That you are going to humble yourself. I say you'll humble yourself as a husband. You're going to humble yourself as a wife. You're going to humble yourself so the presence of God can come back into that home. I say that your home is blessed. If there be any demonic control, we break it in the name of Jesus. According to Exodus 12, 23, we take the oil of God and we put it on the doorpost of your home. We put it on your bedrooms of your children. We put it on your nephews and nieces. And we say that the destroyer will not be able to touch their lives. Jesus, we thank you, God, that we walk out in the blessing because we have committed to be all in in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Give God a hand.